Well, good morning. Welcome to Wake Up in the Word. We are in the last chapter of the book of Psalms today, looking at Psalm 150. Come and join me. It's a tremendous passage of scripture, very short psalm, but heavy with meaning. The book of Psalms began with God blessing humanity. Talking about how the person is blessed, who doesn't walk in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stand in the way of sinners, nor sit in the seat of the scornful. But it ends with people blessing God. A tremendous song of worship right here at the end. In this last psalm, praise to God springs up like a fountain. It spreads out in all directions, says John Phillips. It plunges down again only to soar once more skyward in an endless round of song. So as we look at this particular psalm, there's four basic uh, things to notice about it. Uh, the auditorium of praise, the anthem of praise, the accompaniment of praise, and the audience of praise. It's one of those psalms that begins, as all these last psalms have in the book, with a hallelujah. So we can ultimately say this is the last hallelujah chorus of the book. As it begins, it says hallelujah in verse 1. Now again, you may have an English translation that says praise the Lord. Uh, it's about the same thing, but the statement there is literally hallelujah. Yah, as the shorter name for Yahweh, uh, speaking of God himself. So in the Hebrew, it actually begins hallelujah and ends hallelujah. So uh, hallelujah, praise God in his sanctuary, praise him in his mighty heavens. Now, first of all, as we look at the auditorium of praise, there is one that is below. It mentions praise God in his sanctuary. Now, we used to make fun of that particular word. I've heard famous preachers, could name a few, who said, I don't like to call this place we worship a sanctuary. Ah, my goodness, that sounds too formal. A uh, sanctuary is a place where you protect birds, not a place where you worship God. And everybody would say amen and glory. But the word sanctuary comes straight from the Bible, folks. And it doesn't mean that God needs protection inside that place. What it means is very much like the chorus, the song we sang, surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. It talks about a place where people of God have gathered, where two or three are gathered in his name. There, the Lord says, I'll be in the middle of them. So that's what the sanctuary below looks like. And it doesn't mean you have to construct walls for God to be there in worship. During the COVID-19 pandemic, we once again have experienced more of the power of worshiping God in nature and worshiping outside. From the beginning, we've been doing drive-in church, something we used to do, of course, in, in Asheville, North Carolina, just as an extra way to reach some people early on a Sunday morning for various reasons. Something that uh, Robert Harris, tremendous evangelist, the circuit riding preacher, started back in the 1960s. So it's not something unfamiliar to the body of Christ. But for the most part, we've locked ourselves inside buildings. And now the power of praise we're discovering is even more powerful in the sanctuary of the very nature God has provided for us. But there is a sanctuary below, and that sanctuary is anywhere the people of God gather indoors, outdoors, in a cave, it doesn't matter, a place where the praises of the Lord are being lifted. But then there's a sanctuary above because it says, praise him in his mighty heavens. As we read, especially the book of Revelation, we see some of the most powerful praise of all is taking place even now and in the future in heaven itself. The anthem we find in verse 2, which says, Praise him for his acts of power. Praise him for his surpassing greatness. It's been described all throughout the book of Psalms. How great is our God. We have songs about it even today. It's hard to put in words, but isn't it wonderful to try? Praise him for his surpassing greatness. And then we have the accompaniment in verses 3 through 5. Now, some of you just don't like this idea. The idea that you can have multiple instruments praising the Lord. It looks to me like it's saying that the more, the better. Now, this particular psalm isn't saying these are the only instruments you should use in worship. I think what it's saying is in every way, in every possible way you can, praise God. So in verse 3, it says, praise him with the sounding of the trumpet. Praise him with the harp and the lyre. Praise him with tambourine and dancing. How about that? Praise him with the strings 
and flute. Praise him with the clash of cymbals and praise him with resounding cymbals. Now listen, this is not a, a prescription that every time you worship, you must have these certain instruments. What it's saying is everything that makes music unto the Lord, use it. Use it in any way possible. I've seen people on a stage with nothing more than trash cans, praising God with them and beating them to the praise of God. Friends, listen, it doesn't matter what you've got, use it. And if you've got a talent, perhaps that has now been sharpened because you've been trapped at home and you had to break out the old saxophone and uh, play it a little more, you had to once again hone up your guitar playing skills or something else, then it may be God's just trying to tell you, listen, I gave you this ability, this gift, this talent. I want you to use it for the greatest of all purposes, and that's to praise the Lord. So praise him using any accompaniment that you possibly can uh, that glorifies and honors the Lord Jesus Christ. And then finally, we see the audience in verse six. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Well, that pretty much covers it all, doesn't it? It, it doesn't matter uh, who you are, where you're from. It doesn't matter what language you speak or if you cannot speak at all and your only praise is to dance or lift your hands before the Lord. Everything, everything that has breath should praise the Lord. And again, then it ends with, in English translations, many of them say praise the Lord, but the more accurate ones will say hallelujah, hallelujah. So friends, wherever you are, I want to tell you there is power in praise. Praise the Lord with all your strength and with whatever he has given you to praise him with. Raise another hallelujah to the King of Kings. That's how you and I survive each and every day whether or not there is some kind of pandemic going on. And it reminds me as we read this particular psalm of what we will see uh, one day in heaven above. And we see that in Revelation chapter 7, as we see Psalm 150 being acted out in that heavenly auditorium. It says in uh, Revelation 7 verse 9, After this I looked and beheld before me a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, tribe, people, and language standing before the throne and in front of the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands, and they cried out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing there around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. They fell down on their faces before the throne, and they worshiped God, saying, Amen praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. You know, the power of worship doesn't end on this planet. It only explodes into a crescendo of heavenly praise when we stand before the throne of the Lord. Why not get in practice now while you've got a chance? Well, God bless you. Thank you for being with me Throughout the book of Psalms, some of you have been with me from day one as we've looked uh, through the Psalms and seen these beautiful pictures of praise to our Lord. Now it's time for us to go out and practice what we've learned. Raise a hallelujah to him today, and I'll see you again tomorrow right here as we wake up in the Word.